Yeah, as, as we were saying, this this card has been in the works. The concept of a of a lightweight tournament in in one has been something that has been talked about for well over a year at this point. Ever since the start of the pandemic, when Glory were losing its fighters, like to the child when Marek bigorian has been in one for a while now. Georgia petrosian has been here for like three years, I think. Um, everybody knew that there were so many massive, massive names that they had to do something with this, which would justify. Uh, having all these signed under one roof, you know, and, and a big tournament like this and a title fight with the top two guys on top of it was was just essential. I mean, you look you look at the quality that's on show here. Chingiz Alazov's here, Typhon Ozkan, who's been one of the standout guys from the, the Dutch circuit for a long time. Um, a tournament of this caliber was just, was just, it had to happen. It just took so long to put together. But now it's finally here and it's got underway and the event absolutely delivered. I mean, the event really on paper was... Too good to fail, or too big to fail, in my opinion. I don't know. I don't know about that. I've heard that Petrosian is not that good, you know, for getting washed that that badly. I mean, oh, yeah, who Petrosian's, does that? He's finished. He's old news. I, I, we forgot about him already. He's already lost. Yeah, yeah he's out like, of the mix. Come on. I mean, why would you lead your your entire event with a guy who just gets knocked out? Yeah. Uh, imagine losing in a kickboxing fight as a kickboxer. I know. How could he be so stupid? People are even running around calling him the greatest of all time. Yeah, I mean, Ridiculous. not my goat. No, my goats not my do goat not win. get knocked out in yes, an embarrassing never. fashion. It's never happened to, to a great fight before. Exactly, That's especially in kickboxing, just right. unheard of. Yeah, especially the sport where just everything is power shots and everybody fights a hundred times a year. Yeah, never happens. I mean. I mean, I, I will I will go into the Petrosian thing right now by just like dropping a bit of news because I know everybody's been asking about how is he because he got knocked out so badly in like a, a way that was as enthralling and as exciting as it was. It was also partly horrifying to see somebody. Yeah, full on known. serious mode. Uh, yeah. When when people go down stiff as a board, <laughs> it's oh. kind of not a good sign. No, <laughs> not, it just... was not an ordinary knockout, and I think everybody knew that the moment that it happened. Superbon knew that before Petrosian even touched canvas, Superbon was screaming. Like, the guy knew he'd got him. It was such a clean, perfect head kick. It's, it's kind of one of those when straight, like, right as it connects, you, you just kind of know it's done, it's finished. There's yeah, just, the sound just no two ways about it. Yeah, there was, Out. There was, yes, it was like dropping a block of wood on a, on a cement slab. Like, it was absolutely picture perfect. And... Petrosian went into surgery last night for a broken jaw. Uh, so, yeah, that's that seems very, very severe. And at his age and the stage of his career, I don't know that he's ever going to fight again after something like that. Um, 35, he'll be at least 36 when he comes back. I mean, when he lost to Andy Risty about what had been like eight years ago, he took a full year out. So uh, he's going to, he's going to, I mean, and that, that wasn't anywhere near as bad as this. That was just a freak punch he caught and it just put him out. This was you know, near beheading level brutality. Wasn't so, there a, a, a bit of controversy surrounding the Andy Risto KO or was, it the, was that just uh, fight fans being fight fans and kind of like talking out their ass? Yeah, so there's, there's an interesting parallel with that KO with the Antonio Margarito Miguel Cotto situation where hmm. everybody suspected that Margarito was using Plaster of Paris in his hand wraps for that fight, but he actually got caught in his next fight. So Andy Risti knocking out Petrosian he got caught with tampered or loaded gloves, I believe, the next year huh. or a year after that. So it was it was something that people kind of, you know, used to retroactively explain something that they always had suspicions about. So it's it's a grey area with that one for sure. I mean, they never rematched, unfortunately, and Andy Risty kind of fell off the face of the planet for a while there. He took a huge leave of absence from the sport, and there were tons of rumours about what he was getting up to. Um, but this knockout compared to that one is... Uh, it's levels and levels above, I think, and mm -hmm. it just—it's the kind of knockout that just makes you think. Like it takes—it makes you take into account Petrosian's entire career up until this point, the years and years of dominance, just the characteristic of his his style being so so clean and defensively responsible, and so good at neutralizing opponents and not letting them do what they wanted to do to him. And some people called him boring. And you can say he was boring, but he wasn't boring because he was bad. He was boring because he was so good. And he was able to turn fights into his kind of dance every single time. 
and all those years and years of dominance it's come to an end in a in a climactic fashion to say the least and that would be as good a point as any to actually introduce ourselves. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> why the hell not? Uh, if you hadn't noticed, you're listening to Tengridome. I'm your host, Iggy, and with me today is uh, Luke. Uh, you may know him from his affiliation with uh, Beyond Kick. Uh, if you follow Beyond Kick on Twitter, and you you would know him, and you would know of him, and you uh, you are still not following Beyond Kick on Twitter, and are not part of the Discord, then what the hell are you doing with your life, man? But uh, regardless, very happy to have you here. Finally, after so many months and months of uh, the fight side not covering kickboxing, <laughs> because yeah. the UFC schedule is so fucking relentless, and uh, not to yes. mention way, way worse <laughs> in terms of the quality that they put on, this was yeah, the perfect yeah. occasion to <clears throat> bring Luke on. Uh, so no, you're right. I think I think moments like this, where there is a, a result in the sport of kickboxing that's so significant and makes everybody stop and take notice, which I think is what we've seen happen. I mean, we've seen so many people talking about this this fight and this event as like, oh, wow, I should watch kickboxing more because like this is maybe the only thing they'll see all year. You know, very similar to the, the, the Takaru Leona Pettis fight earlier this year. Mm. It's just the, the sport can only create so many of these moments because it's such a fragmented kind of scene, which is why outlets like Beyond Kickboxing are so important and for like if without but without beyond without beyond kick i would i would have no idea what's going on it's such a hard sport to follow because it's so atomized and spread out and in a hundred different time zones different countries um so when one fc put together a tournament like this it really sets the stage for one of those few opportunities you have where you have just quality matchups with the best fighters in the world in the best division in the sport back to back to back all on one night and yeah, I mean, we had to talk about it. It was on paper. This event was we were probably going to talk about this, regardless of how the main event went down. The main Definitely. event going down like that it's, is just uh, kind of put an exclamation point on it. Even if uh, the main event turned out to be like a, either a grind fest or a sort of like a like a, a back and forth, the uh, uh, split decision or whatever, no matter the outcome, this one warranted coverage from basically everyone who cares about combat sports. Yeah, and uh, essentially, like uh, I always find find myself wondering, like, what if I watched more kickboxing? What if I, uh, what if there was more kickboxing on? And um, I really want want to. I always find myself thinking, like, I really, really want to get into kickboxing, and uh, because there's so many fun guys in there, and it seems like a fun sport, and it seems like uh, crazy shit happens there. Uh, all the time and then i look at the list of events i try to find a list of events and there's like like a dozen different organizations like alphabet soup organizations as uh <laughs> Bourdon calls them yeah, yeah definitely <laughs> all the sanctioning body like messiness in boxing kickboxing is just like that but just with promotions instead yeah and also everyone keeps clamoring for that uh fight between uh takero and uh uh, tension and it never and it is seems like a mythical ephemeral event that is never going to happen and the reason for that is that they just belong to different organizations and yeah and it's signed with different promotions politics. exactly it's the stuff that ruins all combat sports so i will do a quick name drop right now as a really really handy resource for anybody that wants to you know just track things a bit better in, in kickboxing there's this website called kicksdb.com that's k-i-x-d-b.com and it lists basically every upcoming event in a really, really handy kind of compact way with the full cards, uh, where the event is, what day it's taking place on, all that kind of stuff. That's a really nice little website and it's very up to date as well. So all the stuff that goes on in Eastern Europe, uh, you know, Romania, Lithuania, Estonia, they have their own scenes and there's, there's always stuff going on there. Japan has a massive scene. And um, yeah, that's a, that's a really neat little website that people can use. That's kixdb.com, K-I-X-D-B.com. Oh, there you have it. If you wish to follow kickboxing more closely, uh, just follow Luke's advice. But yeah, uh, I was I was kind of in a rut, in a bit of a like um, uh, like a creative rut uh, lately because uh, the fight site is um, mostly mostly follows MMA very closely, but 
And uh, MMA has been kind of boring and shit lately. And I was like, fucking hell, what, what should I do? What should I produce? And like, and then suddenly I, w- I started hearing all about this insane, crazy card that is just going to happen right now in a few hours in one championship. And I was like, fucking one championship putting on a good event. <laughs> uh, and I was like, oh yeah, kickboxing is actually really good at one championship. Who is on? Uh, I'm looking at the list of uh, guys and I just stacked it's like name upon name upon name like what the fuck is happening yeah (laughs) i should catch this one yeah it was it was a don't miss kind of event and honestly it's crazy because it should have been even better it should have had a couple of other key matchups on the card that got removed at the last minute for one reason or another rod tang was on the card fighting daniel puertas he got pulled uh, officially for covid but people generally assume he got pulled because he needs to train because he's fighting demetrius johnson oh, in, for fuck's uh, sake in like three weeks yeah exactly <laughs> oh, so Jesus. he was we were supposed to get rod tang in a kickboxing bout that got pulled we were also supposed to get um tawan chai fighting semipatch fairtex in a really really highly anticipated muay thai fight that got pulled because i think tawan chai got uh covid as well so as a fantastic this card was amazing it delivered i want to make that clear i'm not bitching but i mean imagine what we could have had on top of all this it really was before the the last minute kind of um, mess ups with those two matchups. I mean, this card was was mythical. It was incredible. It's like it's like nothing else I've seen in a in a long long time. And it was anyway. It turned out that way because what we were left with was still just bulletproof quality. From I mean, top to bottom. These things just generally tend to happen in combat sports and like as is it's uh perfectly fine if someone like gets pulled or someone gets injured it's kind of par for the course but the one thing that irks me is the rod tank versus demetrius johnson thing uh <sighs> which is like why 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 are you doing this yeah yeah i mean it's it's of it's they're doing it because they want to get attention mm-hmm. and it has worked. I've seen a ton of people anticipating and talking about it would normally never acknowledge. People that wouldn't even acknowledge DJ's MMA fights in one are talking about it because Rod Tang has such a big uh, appeal now. Um, personally, yeah, as, as, as a matchup from like a sporting perspective, I don't really have that much interest in it because it's going to be in a giant cage. And, you know, Rod Tang's not an effective cage cutter at all. So after the three Rotang minutes... is kind of not a good ring cutter either. No. Yeah, so forget <laughs> so... A, a giant football pitch-sized circular cage with a guy who's known for having fast feet in DJ who's going to be able to evade him for three minutes and then just do what he wants to him in the MMA round. So that's just the, the nature of the matchup. But um, 1FC are going to do what they're going to do. Uh, they've got a... They've got a huge amount invested, uh, and they have to they have to create something that, that gets attention. And um, yeah, circling back around to this event, I mean, the main event result has certainly done that in in no short order. I mean, I have already seen comments comments to the nature of uh, basically that basically amount to oh now the casual eyes are gonna be like now the casual fans understand how powerful Superbon really is, and like casual fans. Who the fuck are you talking about? Yes, so exactly. Like, what casual fans no, that's, are yeah, gonna exactly. tune in to watch one kickboxing? Yeah, <laughs> like... that's, that's the nature of kickboxing is that it's it's such a high barrier to entry in terms of the amount of time you have to invest. To <laughs> like the only casual fans that are really out there, to quote Ryan Wagner, are the bots that One FC has programmed to make yeah. it seem like they have more viewers than they actually do. Yeah, you've got you've got the potential fans, and then you've got like the Moroccans that only show up for Badahari fights. Mm-hmm. Those are the only like two large groups that promoters can kind of try and court to bring in on these big events. Because otherwise, yeah, the core fan base itself that is actually able to to track this stuff and and show up live to watch is is tiny. It's minuscule. Let's be and honest. I I kind of noticed that everyone sort of knows everyone in the kickboxing sphere purely oh, yeah. because of how small it is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's um. It's a very, very uh, like small slice of the combat sports um, world that have, yeah, it, it requires a, a real interest in the sport itself and just the amount of free time that you don't have from following other sports. I mean, that's that's why we can we can talk a bit about glory here and how many years they've spent and how many millions of dollars they've spent trying to get into America and why it will never ever work because everybody in America already has everything they need from the fight sport world. They have UFC every week. They have boxing every week. There is no room there to get in 
to capture an audience that's currently not being serviced. They're all being serviced. There's a there's a Bellator tonight. I think there's a, is there a UFC tonight? I don't know. There, was I, a... I, there is, of course there is, right. but uh, no yeah. one should watch it. No. <laughs> it's a, it's an Aspen-led main event. Oh, Come on. brilliant. Yeah, I'm there. <laughs> so, yeah, so there's a Bellator UFC tonight. There was ESPN Boxing last night. Navarrete and Joet Gonzalez beat the shit out of each other. Like, there is so much combat sports in America that any promotion that's trying to fully like move into that audience into that audience is going to just have a, have a nightmare of a time getting anybody's attention for more than five seconds because there's so much else going on that they're already familiar with so this is what happens with the sport of kickboxing is you'll have momentary flashes of popular attention from people with events like this and you know maybe stuff like you know the Badahari rico fights i mean um, I, I guess it's sort of for the benefit of the sport in a certain sense because uh now, kickboxing has so many, so much more historical moments compared to, uh, say, I mean, MMA certainly has a, a way less storied history than kickboxing, and uh, boxing has been around for ages. But everyone to this day, I still find fans who were watching kickboxing way back when and are still remembering all those huge tournaments where just chaos was happening all around where the best of the best clashed together and it led to crazy outcomes and uh, weird twists and uh, freak injuries and freak knockouts all that just basically everything that is unpredictable and chaotic and uh, uh, exciting about combat sports was condensed into a single event for a single night and yeah yeah those, those k1 tournaments where you would have an, an eight man um, three round tournament on one night, the, the the kind of which that Andy Sauer was in a bunch of classics in the uh, you know the mid two thousands. That's what one is trying to recreate here. They're trying to get that same buzz, that that same kind of. Um, they're trying to create the same kind of memory that those K one Max and those K one World Grand Prix burned into the minds of those fans that people still talk about today with a glint in their eye because it was so singular and powerful and you know enduring the memory of those tournaments um is it on that level i don't know because mm. i think there's some aspects of one's promotion that i think maybe prevent it from ever reaching that level they kind of just i'll just uh say it right away one is kind of cringe in general over like overall yeah <laughs> like the name yeah, yeah. of one is basically essentially has poisoned the well on how well their tournaments are going to be received because of their shady promotion and uh, shady PR campaigns and how they promote themselves and how they carry themselves in the combat sports wo world and the, all the um, overturning of results that keeps happening in one chattery fucking be being the head of one. All of that kind of puts a bit of a hard cap on how well the tournaments are going to be received, I think. And first yes. of all, if if they, in the first, if they wished the tournament to be received uh, uh, more warmly i suppose uh, they should have the tournament should have taken place in the ring for, i yes. mean for fuck's sake yeah <laughs> it's kickboxing why, yeah. why would you want the cage to be there it's a it's a fucking circle first of all it's gigantic yeah. and yeah. basically all kickboxers who are participating you, you could notice it throughout the night kickboxers were like they would back themselves up and try to lean on the fence and be like surprised that there's a fence there instead of the ropes and like yeah what, and there's like, no deal. The it's like a brick wall yeah <laughs> yeah they're not trained to negotiate that kind of space and it's very obvious when especially you've, you've, we've seen certain fights where they just never really get out of first gear because extended exchanges are so hard to force when you have angles that open for somebody to circle you know out of range into um, so the, the cage doesn't help. I, I think it. I think it affects the sport, but it also affects just like the visuals of the product. Like mm -hmm. these fighters are so drowned in the vastness of this space. It just. It just. It makes it feel less significant than when they're in a ring and and it just. It's almost like they're on a they're on a pedestal or an altar. You know, it, it has this very um this very open feeling to it where they're the main main attraction, whereas the cage just kind of dwarfs them in its its size and its height. So yeah, like, I think that has a negative effect. With MMA, at least it physically encloses the space, so it limits. Um, the, like uh, there, there are no restarts in the center of the of um, the cage as it is with the ring. No one mm. falls through the fence while wrestling, so it serves an actual physical mechanical purpose. It doesn't serve that purpose here in kickboxing, no, but I'm sure yeah, we can get into no into it all later. But 
we've talked for 20 minutes already about whatever the fuck everything but the event even though we started talking about the event <laughs> which is the reason is, why we're here yeah this is the nature of one fc and they are so peculiar in the in just their their pr campaigns and the way they the way they communicate to the fans their booking how about the fact that like two of the fighters in this tournament like missed weight yesterday and missed their hydration test limits uh, Andy Sauer was one of them. I can't remember who the other one was. It might have been Enrico Cal, but like, and that wasn't announced officially on their big weigh-in show. Like, it's it's it's, and also the card being reshuffled and having the prelims cut off and and put on another event that wasn't announced. It's just like one FC. I think don't get the credit they deserve, but it's entirely their own fault because they put so many other things in the mix which make people just kind of view them with a kind of a side eye and, and a certain cynicism that they don't view any other promotion with because no other promotion acts as as just opaquely as they do yeah everyone has uh, each promotion has a degree of shadiness attached to it that's just how combat sports work in general but one fc kind of is just has the this uh this aura surrounding them and in everything they do it's kind of like weird hush hush stuff and it reminds me of uh, it's kind of it's kind of has all the worst uh shady asian mafia tropes attached to it behind yeah. the scenes yeah <laughs> so it kind of it just affects everything but let's focus God damn it! We will yes. focus. We shall focus. There are fights to uh, talk about. There, there, there are fights. There, ac there are actually tons of good fights. There was, yeah, there were tons of good fights on this event, uh, and uh, we started talking about the main event for getting sidetracked. Uh, Georgia Petrosian versus Superbon. Come on, why was this so significant? You, you, you would know all about it. Uh, you would describe it way better than me. Yeah, so I mean, this matchup on paper was, uh, I, I, you've got to say, it was easily Georgia Petrosian's been, you know, a dominant force of this weight class for God knows how long at this point. I mean, probably I think two thousand and nine was the year he really took over, and no one has really mounted a sustained campaign at this weight to really unseat him from that, you know, consensus top spot. And he was fighting a guy in Super Bomb Banchimek who's just in the best form of his career, has totally figured out his style as, as a kickboxer. He came in as more of a Muay Thai guy, and now he's just he's just a, a savage clinical striker. And on paper, this matchup just looked like either Petrosian was gonna was gonna lose or he was gonna score the kind of impressive win that we haven't seen from him in a long, long time. It was it was just mouth watering. You know, Superbon's coming off the probably the biggest win of his kickboxing career against Sithichai last summer. Uh, in his uh, in his one debut, Petrosian had been out for quite some time. He won a, a massive cash prize in 2019 for their tournament, where he won a million dollars cash for beating up um, Sami Sana, who was also on this card, and then uh, Joe Natawa, another another Thai fighter. Um, and he'd taken some time off since then. He came back and beat David Kiria earlier this year, and now he had to step up. He really did have to step up against Superbon. Who was was you know easily the number one contender in in the one uh, seventy kg division, and just the momentum both fighters had, you know that their rankings going into this fight they were both in the top ten on the the beyond kickboxing pound for pound list, which is just I mean that says it all as far as how anticipated this kind of matchup is. I mean the only other matchup that you would see two pound for pound fighters on the beyond kickboxing list going against each other would be the matchup tension in Takaru. So this is this is all this is almost I mean, speaking objectively, this fight is almost as good as that one, really, as far as far as a as a, a technical showcase was concerned. And yeah, the result uh, absolutely justifies that level of anticipation because we saw uh, a, a true changing of the guard, a true crowning moment for Superbon in just a, a a picture perfect performance where he showed every single layer of his of his fight IQ and his offense and his ability to establish patterns and break them against the master of doing that in Petrosian. Um, I mean, yeah, what what really separated Petrosian and made him special in my eyes, uh, and I haven't seen a lot of them. Uh, haven't seen a lot of him. I will say that uh, right out of the gate to sort of get this out of the uh, out of the way. But uh, every time I watched him fight, I noticed that he kind of like. He's sort of. Uh, this will be a bit of a pleb comparison, <laughs> but he sort of That's reminded okay. re reminded me of Lomachenko a lot uh, in how he 
had this established process of pushing his guy to the to the cage, uh, to the fence. I'm sorry, <laughs> to the fucking fucking ropes for fuck's there sake. There we go. Ah, uh, Jesus. To the fucking ropes, and uh, he always had this very clinical and uh, set idea on how he's going to operate. Everything had made sense in how he operated. And there was no wasted motion. His entire rear, the entire rear side of his body was turned into basically a platform for launching attacks. And uh, everything looked the same. He would, uh, the, he, the, um, turning motion of the hip disguised the right hand. It disguised the knee that he likes to use so much. He it disguises the round kicks. And, uh, he would, uh, his hand fighting was always on point and he's uh he was a very active jabber with a with a nasty right hook and basically everything worked in tandem to make uh, uh, to make his uh, defense all that more potent and the reason why his defense was so potent was that he always controlled the initiative and in this fight and superborn was always really good at uh, fighting in open stance matchups always very good with uh, with fighting southpaws uh, his hand fighting was always also very good. He always knew how to create openings for his kicks, for his uh, hands, and uh, he was all. He is also essentially a com- complete fighter when it comes to kickboxing. And so, uh, even from a fr- uh, from a technical standpoint, from a very like pure technique versus technique standpoint, this is this was an extremely fascinating matchup as well because I kind of um, uh, once again I haven't watched a lot of uh, Super Bond's fights and uh, neither I watched a lot of um, uh, Petrosian but I did some footage studies before the uh, before the event and uh, this is this was just the sort of things that I found fascinating about them and this just made me more excited before I started watching them and then the fights actually happens and everything just unfolds exactly as you would think if you studied them from a technical perspective like Superborn uh, stifled uh, Petrosian's lead hand, and uh, he tried to win every hand fighting exchange. He would. Uh, Petrosian was looking for knees and for round kicks while pressuring. He was looking to walk uh, Superborn onto knees, and he connected with a couple of them with a couple of good ones. But overall, Superborn was controlling the engagements and the terms uh, upon which the engagement started very well from right out of the gate uh, right out of the gate even though it kind of looked like petrosian may have start, started to take over at certain points but every time it happened petrosian was uh superborn basically like tried to wring that initiative back from petrosian and secure that initiative and uh this is what led to the knockout really but uh since you're my guest i will let you to recap the fight on your own terms how did you see the fight what did you think do you agree with anything that was said? <laughs> no, no, absolutely. I think I think we saw Superbon start very, very fast and, like you say, capture the initiative immediately and have a clear game plan of what he came in here to do, which was just establish kicking range right off the bat and force Petrosian to take risks to break into the pocket. And uh, Superbon was doing a great job in the first round of running him onto right knees up the middle as Petrosian just tried to to not quite march him down, but certainly show a lot of aggression to get out of kicking range, which was not a fight that he wanted to have, I don't think. And Superbon read that aggression perfectly. And by the and by the uh, the start of the second round, I mean, this knockout came only 20 seconds into the second round. This, this came very quickly. He'd already had Petrosian's uh, left cross red and he'd programmed him with, you know, throwing the body kicks and knowing that he was going to pull straight back out and just, you know, he, he pulled him straight onto a head kick knowing that Petrosian was going to come out off his left cross like that. It was um, just a, a phenomenal performance and showing of a guy who's got his skill set so figured out. I mean, it, it looked like Superbon had trained just so specifically for this kind of opponent. And it was really great for him as well that his last fight was against a, a southpaw, uh, more of a kicker in Sithichai than, than Petrosian, but still a, you know, a very, very um, technical, controlling, elusive southpaw. Um, I think Superbon's just got this this style matchup down pat, and I think that's what we saw evidence of that he he found his shot and it was over. It was over in a flash. Yeah, it's kind of like it's um, very interesting whenever really highly talented fighters get blasted out with a fairly basic, a fairly basic setup. What's like on paper, like you'd think 
No, it's just the open stance double attack. It's the body kick into a high kick. Uh, what's so special about that? The special, uh, what, what's so special about that? It's that it's happened to Giorgio Petrosian. Yeah. Like, where do you see that happening? It's like whenever a really uh, high level boxer gets knocked out with a one two, it's basically the same thing. And you have to look at all the things surrounding that one two to really figure out why that happened. I mean, sure, sometimes it's just happen- it just so happens that the guy just gets blasted. It, sure, it's, it's fighting. These things happen. But in this case, Superborn was really zeroed in, like laser-focused on all the openings that he needed to ring out out of Jojo Petrosian to secure that knockout. And you could see him working for that setup the entirety of the, the, the whole first round. And then the first, within the first 20 seconds of the second round, he already had all the reads that he need, needed to secure that win. Yeah, it was, it was really almost like the first meaningful exchange of the second round and in mm-hmm. the fight, um, which I think speaks volumes. I mean, this guy, Superbon, is, is a guy who, if, if you go on his Instagram, on his social media, you see this guy's, he drills that exact maneuver, the uh, body kick to right cross to high kick, three piece. This guy goes out into the ocean, into like waist deep water, and does pad drills with his coach, like jumping out of the water to throw that high kick. It's absolutely insane. So, yeah, he's fighting Giorgio Petrosian, but just doing it in in just thin air, I think it's probably easy for him. I mean, he's a he's a specimen. He's clearly like just a, a, an absolute Spartan when it comes to preparing for these fights. Um, but yeah, that was just something funny that I saw on his social media before this fight. Just the fact that he, the fact that the guy trains in like waist deep ocean water. And not just for the gram. Like, he does this and he's really working on stuff. It's just... Oh, that's the kind of stuff that you get in kickboxing. It's just these incredibly, like, idiosyncratic, strange training methods. <laughs> and they work at the highest, highest levels. Because that's, that's why the basics are good. When the basics are applied properly, they work on everybody. There are no exceptions. That's why yeah, they're the basics. That's, that's fundamentals. It's yeah. what fundamentals are for. And yeah, uh, like... Uh, uh, a listener who is uh, an avid MMA viewer m- may kind of scoff at the idea of like idiosyncratic training methods working because in MMA there are so many instances of uh, uh, idiosyncrasy being uh, used for idiosyncrasy's sake, kind of like, like training telephone like, poles. Yeah, training like weird like meme strikes and uh, <laughs> we're just uh, trying to and like Conor McGregor like posting like instagram videos where he's true working on his muay thai quote unquote and we he, where he's bending over backwards to throw a basic <laughs> to throw a basic leg kick and uh, uh, and then check it's the basicest of basic drills and it looks yeah. all wrong and fucked up because conor mcgregor is an idiot <laughs> yes exactly it's just uh it's just posturing it's the desire to look like you're you know enlightened in some way mm. rather than uh truly emphasizing on the function of what you're doing yeah which is really what is at the core of all of this regardless of how it looks it's about what it does and i'm sure like uh there is a certain tendency amongst fight fans to look to the mystical and to the esoteric to explain certain things like all the fucking body language analysis that is going around on youtube and uh, the magic circles and all that kind of bullshit when really to understand what is happening in front of you you just have to study combat sports you just have to study fighting from a fighting perspective not from a look in the right perspective no exactly it's all there it's all in the cage everything they everybody everybody who fights they fight how they train there are no exceptions so what you're going to see is the results, and the results are all that matters. So look at what's in the cage or in the ring, and that's really the end product and, and the summation of all of it. Yeah, I mean, I guess from we were, when we were watching the fights, uh, I was uh, sitting in a voice chat with uh, uh, the Fight Sites Discord patrons, and we were joking around about all that look in their eye stuff. <laughs> like one of our patrons said that, uh, like. The higher the level of the fight, the less the look matters, and the lesser it is, the more it matters. <laughs> I guess from a certain point of view, it's true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If there's not a lot going on, you have to revert to like very like anti-scientific, uh, uh, you know, observations. I think, mm-hmm. especially when you have no tape evidence to go off of to to in preparation for the fight, when you have no idea what uh, either guy brings to the table. I guess. Yeah, just gesture at something vague, and it'll count. Yeah. And like, 
uh, some of the guys I was watching the fight with knew nothing about Superbon, and so they were like, "Oh, look at Superbon! Yeah, he's uh, he looks goofy, you know, in those sneakers and his tie shorts. It looks like he's just in his boxes taking out the trash." <laughs> and right, Superbon yeah. looked, uh, Superbon was looking kind of like, you know, a bit jittery and sort of like, uh, uh, kind of just trying to look casual. And so yeah. I guess he kind of looked insecure from a certain point of view, and he was like, kind of like looking around, like uh, just uh, fucking with his gloves, trying to kind of sort of adjust them all the time uh, mm. th- throughout the his walkout. And <laughs> he basically looked like he was taking out the trash and was very nervous that there's raccoons abound. <laughs> like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, well. I, I think, considering who he was walking in there to fight, that's uh, he's that, that's, that's perfectly understandable. Control. Yeah, uh, and I mean, this just tells you that you shouldn't take this these things at face value. Um, no, not at all. <laughs> uh, but hey, but, hey, who's going to say anything against him now? Because now he's he's the dom. He's he's truly taken taken control now of this division. I mean. And and you've got to put him up there as, as maybe pound for pound number one right now with a win like that. That's true. And uh, this just brings us to the question of what's really next for Superbon. What's out there? Right, that's honestly, it does put him in a somewhat strange position in the immediate future because as far as all the top contenders that are available for him, they're all tied up in a tournament. And it's not a one-night tournament, it's a, a three-round tournament just in going into its second round now. So it's probably going to be... Uh, I would say probably six months plus before that tournament gets resolved. Um, in the meantime, I assume he'll take another fight. Maybe, maybe he'll do a fight in Thailand. Maybe he'll do another fight in one just to tick over. Um, but as far as the immediate future, I don't see him really fighting any of the any of the top guys just because they're all committed right now. So I think one could find just about anybody for him. Um, get him a run the run out there. He's going to be. Uh, very, very, uh, you know, anticipated now. Whatever he does with a win like this, he's, all eyes are going to be on him for the near future. Um, but once this tournament does get resolved, we'll have an absolute mega fight with whoever is the winner of that, and it could be, it could be anyone, as we've seen from these first fights being so explosive and, and violent. Um, we'll have, yeah, we'll have a huge matchup with Super Bond fighting the next top contender. I don't think we're going to see him and Petrosian again. In fact, I don't think we're going to see Petrosian again uh, in any capacity. That's that's my honest read on that. I think he's... I think he's just... I mean, Petrosian, what is he? Like, he's 35, going to be 36 in two months. 100 plus fights in, the, in a pro career. I don't see him coming back, to be honest with you. And that's that's fine. That's okay. Like, he's, he's made a lot of money. He's made more money than, I think, any non-heavyweight kickboxer purely off the back of that million dollar prize he won in the tournament the other year so he can yeah. he can ride off into the sunset maybe do like a final fight in in italy because he has his own kind of promotion out there called petrosian mania where he would he would fight in uh milan and rome and those places but um yeah i don't think we're going to see these guys rematch that's for sure hmm I would love to see it in a perfect world if if Petrosian you know didn't have his jaw smashed and go into immediate surgery. Yeah, I think we would have to see a rematch purely because of who he is. I mean, and he, f- he fighters, has the the right to that. But. Fighters have recovered from bo- broken jaws um, in the past, but uh, seeing as uh, how much mileage there is on Petrosian and uh, mm. that he's putting on years, it's kind of like it's one of those injuries that become more and more alarming as time goes on. Yeah, and then, and just just the year the year plus of rehab that's going to require mm. is just going to tick down the clock even further. Um, on a guy that look, let's let's also be honest. Um, this was a, a obviously an, an epic, great win and deserving of all the credit that Superbon's getting. Giorgio Petrosian is past his prime, definitively. Everybody knows that he hasn't had the kind of you know classic performances that we've seen from him. You know, in years past when he was in the K1 Max in the first glory tournament, he hasn't had those performances in a while. He's become a lot more, you know, heavy set in his style, much more of a of a boxer puncher, uh, a pressure fighter who's trying to, you know, who's, who was winning fights based on exchanges. He wasn't winning fights based on, you know, pot shotting, which is yeah. what his style was, you know, in, back in the day. So let's just get that out there immediately. Look, Giorgio Petrosian is not somebody who's going to be able to, like, rise from the ashes like a phoenix from this. We've seen him have a slow 
but definitive decline over the past four to five years already. There is one thing I would like to point out, however. If you wish to su have success as an aging fighter, uh, you should look at Giorgio Petrosian for sure. Especially with the way he, like, you should look at the way he's ad adapted to his yes. waning attributes. Yes. Because he's, yeah. he kept utilizing his incredibly solid fundamentals to secure victories still. Yes. Uh, yeah. And he put on muscle, and he became like more of a of, of a stationary puncher. He wasn't moving like he used to, mm. because, like you said, he couldn't. Nobody can do that forever. They have to they have to do what their body tells them. And um, yeah, he definitely had a had a very different character to his style um, as time went on. So uh, this is a a bit of a like a bittersweet note, but I mean that's just combat sports. Kind of have to take the good with the bad. One of um, one of the greats is uh, maybe looking at the twilight of his career, and uh, in the co-main we actually saw one of the all-time greats just uh, retire on a loss and uh, not quite ride off into the sunset uh, <laughs> like, like uh, the the departing hero. But it was um, it was a spirited performance nonetheless. Uh, Marat Gregorian versus Andy Sauer. <sighs> yeah. Um Sauer it wasn't it wasn't poetic, it wasn't beautiful, but he went out on his own terms. He did give a give a spirited performance, absolutely. He was in the fight. He was um clearly losing the fight, but not getting just eviscerated. He was landing shots on Gregorian. Gregorian was probably, you know, maybe not being as defensively responsible as we know he can be. But Andy Sauer, yeah, I mean What's there to say about him? He went out. He went out fighting the best. You know, that's this is what's going to happen, unfortunately. Um, but I will say that he he did not embarrass himself out there, which I think is a, oh, is a real not. credit for a guy who I think is that was this was his twenty third year as a pro. This guy turned pro in ninety nine. So to go in there with a guy like Marek Gregorian, who might be the best lightweight in the world, we've got to find that out with this tournament and. Yeah, this is a guy who who also fought Superbon and also you know iced him in under a minute. So you're talking about a real, real killer. And Andy Sauer went out there and and absolutely acquitted himself well as a legend, a very aged legend, but a legend nonetheless. I mean, they could try and set up Marat Gregorian with City Shy for the fifth time <laughs> at the rate I they're going. I think if, if the final <laughs> if the final goes to that, if if Marat Gregorian beats Chingiz Alazov, which he will be a favourite to do so. And Sithichai beats David Kiria, which he will be a huge favourite to do so. That is what we'll get in the tournament final. We'll get um, Sithichai Marat Part 6. I mean, in a cage. In a cage oh, it's, as well. it's the sixth time, not the fifth. Fucking uh, hell. Yeah. I believe it's the sixth. Yeah, I think, I think um, Sithichai beat him four times and then lost once in glory. Uh huh. And uh, yeah, in a giant circular cage. So. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, Buckle yes. Up. Glory 65. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He did Marad Gregorian decision. I try? don't blame you for losing count because they fought so uh, many times. Jesus. <laughs> uh, I mean, in in essentially any other sport, this would be outrageous, and I think it's it's kind of stretching it a bit still in kickboxing as well. <laughs> no, I agree. I I don't want to nor need to see that fight ever again in my life. Yeah, but and I, I think we will, regardless. Uh, I mean. Uh, I've said this many times before during the course of this podcast, but I mean, you can, just can't win with combat sports. You have to some, you just take what you can get, but and the yeah. rest is just whatever happens. No, exactly, yeah. yeah. But uh, and this, I like how Andy Sauer looked in uh, against Marat Gregorian, especially the things that he was doing. He was very obviously very uncomfortable about fighting in the cage. He was he kept backing up in straight lines and kind of like looking surprised whenever the, the, he his back hit the fence. And he wasn't like circling off, wasn't very mobile. Uh, but I mean, he's 38 years old and he was still countering in combination, uh, trying to use his defense as much as possible. But he was kind of, the reflexes just weren't there. He was very jittery. He was very reliant on blocks, uh, on blocking and uh, his high guard. And the, the punches were still coming through. And obviously, Morag Gregorian sat him down a couple of times and then. The final left hook that set Sandy Sauer down also apparently injured his leg. Something was wrong. So something was up there with his leg. And so uh, the contest was uh, over then and there. But at the very least, Sandy Sauer didn't get sparked out. No. 
thank Christ for small mercies and uh, yep. gave a very heartfelt speech. I would uh, I wouldn't quote it right now. If you really uh, just you should really just go and watch that fight and uh, listen to that speech. It it was a very heartfelt goodbye from a legend. And uh, I think many would agree. I think I saw a lot of kickboxing people talk about how Andy Sauer should be hired as a commentator, uh, thinking that he would do well in there. What do you think, personally? Yeah, I, I would say the interview that he was... Or the, or the speech he was giving, with the kind of emotion that was clearly impacting him at that time, and the fact that also he'd just been lost and stopped, the way that he was describing Marek Gregorian's weird, crooked, like you said, left hook come jab that he was throwing at the end of his combinations that caught Sauer, like just having that kind of observation, the ability to... to to articulate that on the microphone is like, yeah, this guy needs to be on the broadcast. Get Mitch Chilson out of here. And get, well, get Chiavello out of here as get well. Get Chiavello obviously. out of there. <laughs> yeah. Chiavello, whatever Sauer. his name is. Yeah, just have Andy Sauer by himself, for God's sake, because the guy's yeah. got more brains than both of those put together, obviously. Commentators. Um, another thing in common across all combat sports that is shit. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the fighters that are good at it, like Brian Stan and probably Andy Sauer, just never seem to, to stick to it long enough. Um, it's Jimmy Smith, yeah, Jimmy, Jimmy Smith. Smith. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Another guy who just yeah just faded out. Um, like, but yeah, I would love to see Andy Sauer uh, kind of repurposed in that role. He's got he's got so much experience, and he's clearly yeah, a very kind of observant, intelligent dude. And he'd be, I think, he'd be great in that role. Uh, I mean, the the whole event was very good. So, but uh, I, I guess uh, there's not a lot to say about each fight because it everything was very explosive and ended in a very quick fashion but that's just kickboxing for you as you said in the beginning everything is just power punching all the time yeah. uh city chai versus uh typhoon oscan split decision win for city chai what do you think I, I guess this was this was the slow fight of the card um, yeah it was and it was still very action packed nonetheless yeah yeah absolutely it was still a, a one of the best Sithichai performances I've seen in quite some time. It was he. He was authoritative. He took the center of the of the cage. Sorry, I almost said ring. He took the center of the cage. He dictated. It's kick, it's very w- weird to be to catch yourself saying ring uh, about kickboxing because yeah. kickboxing generally should be taking place in in the in the ring. Yeah, yeah. People <laughs> will say ring even about like caged UFC matches. It's such a uh, a bedrock kind of colloquialism of talking about fighting is talking about ring IQ. People don't say mm-hmm. cage IQ, do they? No. So, and um, ring craft, not cage craft. Right, exactly. So we saw, yeah, Sister Chai just dominate the center of the cage there um, using using his, yeah, the classic southpaw double attack, the left middle kick and the left cross. Typhon Ozcan, a guy that I'm really impressed with, um, kind of a strange strategy from him in this fight. I did not expect to see him play the role of the outfighter and trying to you know, time City Chai with his own counters. I thought Typhon Oskan was going to come forward and throw volume. You know, I think but... this is one of those fights where the cage may have actually played a role in how both fighters approach their fight. Like, right. Okay. Because it's so gigantic, and because uh, City Chai is going to be looking for, like, for looking to blast those kicks and uh, use the double attack and all that stuff, Typhon Oskan probably just realized that, oh, I'm in this huge space, and City Chai is very dangerous in the pocket. So I may mm. may as well just avoid him for however many rounds and try to right. try and to get find away my and spots. then fight in spots exactly, which is really what he did and um, was not a, a, a justifiable split decision in my view. I don't see how you can score that fight for Typhon Ozcan. He just he didn't have the clean power strikes and he didn't have the volume either. To be honest, with mm. you. So this guy was really active yeah. in this fight. The kicks were there all day for City Chai. He still found ways to navigate uh, this uh, weird matchup. And this weird space that he's not used to, because uh, he, he kind of had trouble tracking Oscan down. But whenever he did, he I think he outlanded him handily. And once again, this was one of those bits where the commentary pissed me off because the commentary was talking about how Oscan has a clear speed advantage. And honestly, I did not see that. I, th- I personally saw that. Uh, personally, thought that each exchange that happened between the two was dead even in terms of speed. Yeah, when they threw together, it was absolutely even. I think maybe they were just tricked by the fact that Ozcan was moving and flurrying. Mm-hmm. He looked speedier because he was fighting on his bike. But mm-hmm. no, there was he was he was not really yeah snappier or 
or faster than Sithichai here. Um, so it was, yeah, uh, the, the strategy for me from Ozcan was was kind of strange. I did not expect that. This was his first fight since the start of the pandemic. So he had a huge layoff. He signed to one quite some time ago, and his de- his, his debut just came, kept getting delayed and delayed through a mixture of uh, you know COVID shutdowns in Singapore and his own injuries. So this was a this was a monumental task for him to come in here after twenty months out the out the ring and fight a guy like Sithichai. But um, he'll come again. He'll be back. He's he's thirty, which isn't young, but he doesn't really have the kind of ring time a lot of these other guys do already. So I think I still think he's got a, a good few years left of 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 quality uh, operation here. Um, but yeah, so the time moves on. He's gonna fight David Kiria in the the next round. Mm. Um, yeah, man, the guy the guy is just a, a consummate professional. We've people have been doubting him, saying that maybe he's past his prime. He had a couple of shaky performances there. He had one in um uh in Thailand, I believe, his first Muay Thai fight in a long time against a pretty like unknown opponent where he looked kind of labored and people thought he might be finished, but. He he's 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 come back now with two huge wins against Ozcan and, and Tao and Chai. So mm-hmm. yeah, watch out. Sidichai might just end up taking this whole thing again. I mean, him and Marek Gregorian historically is still a very one sided matchup, even if Marek won the last one. Yeah. It's kinda of like the the book is kind of written on that particular matchup. <laughs> I guess Marek Gregorian did give his best in the in the uh in the last one, but I mean all the ways through which City Chai can beat him are still there. Yeah. It's not like Marat Gregorian suddenly reinvented himself just to beat City Chai. No, not at all. And I believe his his last fight in one was against uh Kondratiev, the Russian, and that was a another Southpaw matchup and Marat got dropped hard in that fight in the first mm-hmm. round. So the Southpaw thing still seems to be his nemesis. So And yeah, yeah there's there's still a, a bit of a uh controversy surrounding that uh, City Chai versus Tamen Chai fight. And first of all, I think a lot of it uh, has to own itself to the way one booked the fight. It was, first of all, it was three rounds. Yeah. Like, City Chai versus Tamen Chai, why would you book it for three rounds? And second of all, they, they were, like, they were kind of the first... It's like you, we saw the preview to the actual fight. They were, like, <laughs> all three right. rounds was just them trying to get a beat on each other. And then if... If uh, the fight was booked correctly, the, the follow-up to the following two rounds would have been the actual would be the rounds where all the actual action would be contained. Uh, exactly. Yeah, they were just warming up, but um, yeah, that's also just the nature of one when yeah, exactly when fights are falling out with COVID and guys are getting slotted in. So I think we'll see those two guys fight again for sure. I would very much like to see them fight again. It's, yeah. it's a very interesting matchup, and Tao and Chai is also great. Yeah, exactly. He's so fun to watch. But uh, moving on, Sami Sana versus uh, Chingis Alazov. Chingis Alazov just just stormed out like a house on fire. Oh, did he ever. I mean, what? Chingis Alazov's hallmark to me is a guy who attacks all three levels very, very effectively. And we saw this just in the first 30 seconds. He, he kicked Sami Sana's lead leg to square him up, set, used that to set up the high kick, and then finish him off with a body shot against the cage. Like, it was just... It was just beautiful work from Chingiz Alazov, who's you know just a, a a very a very um just a violent fighter who just throws incredible power shots with technique at all three areas. Um, he had a long time off before his debut in one, which was his last fight, which was a huge upset where he lost to Enrico Kell. But he didn't he didn't look himself in that and fight. I think everybody saw a lot of cage rust for him going into that one. And by the way. Personally, I do not agree with that decision, or at the very at the very least, I did not agree with that decision early on when I watched it the first time around. Sure, yeah. Like, uh, no, that's that's totally fair. Yeah, Alazov was, was what, landing the way out. more impactful shots, and uh, Enrico Kelly was kind of like walking forward, shoe shining. Yes, and I guess yes. that that's why he got the decision. Like he basically just duped the judges into believing that he was winning. <laughs> right, and that's that's what Kell was trying to dupe David Kiria with uh, in in the fight previous to this one as well with. Throwing a lot of volume early, but just hanging out in, in Kira's kitchen for too long and just mm-hmm. getting clocked with a, a looping overhand right on the temple. His legs went and it was just over from that point. I mean, Kira, you know, scored the other two knockdowns, but they were very much just a formality. Kel just could not stand upright after that shot. And, uh, yeah, I mean, basically we covered the entire card <laughs> in the span of a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's what's so crazy is these first these first two fights were just so short. They were like 
these were TikTok, you know, length fights, which I'm sure one love for their yeah, viral they, they start. They also started with heavyweights, like uh, Rada Pacic versus Patrick, Patrick uh, Schmidt. Yeah. And uh, I kind of... That wasn't much of a fight. <laughs> yeah, I kind of zoned out of that, uh, of that one. I was like, oh, it's over now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, nobody was really anticipating that. I mean, Patrick Schmidt, is just, he was just a big... Big heavy bag in there, wasn't he, for running mm. up the church, wasn't he? So, yeah, that was just your customary heavyweight fight. Had to have a heavyweight fight somewhere, and at least it didn't go too long. Yeah, at least they had the sense to put it up way down there in the beginning. and not Yes, like... where it belongs. <laughs> where it belongs. Very much unlike how the UFC does things. <laughs> if yeah. you're a heavyweight at all, you're on, on, like, the, on the poster. <laughs> yeah. Basically. Like, basically, you just have to be fat and big that's all you need to do like to to be slotted into the main card and be yeah. somewhere there in there on the poster with the ufc yeah. so uh, that's andrei olovsky just making a killing for years <laughs> he's got a really a great deal <laughs> he's got a really great deal doesn't he he's oh basically... yeah the guy he makes like half a million dollars a fight yeah just show up it's just grind hilarious. your just grind a, a bad fat guy out yeah get the decision go home Cash in, boom! You can you can buy houses with the kind of purses he's he's pulling in. It's it's hysterical. Uh, one thing but, yeah. I would like to point out about uh, Enrico Kiel, uh, uh, it may sound like I don't like him, and uh, really the fact of the matter is that I haven't watched a lot of him at all. But the one uh, showing that he's had against Alazov and the way that that he he he, he has robbed Alazov. Has mm. made him my arch enemy in kickboxing. I finally have my obscure, like kind of sort, kind of sort of mid tier kickboxing fighter that I dislike, there you <laughs> just go. on you principle, your... irrationally. Okay. Now you're talking like a kickboxing fan. <laughs> now uh, you see, you found your, you found your pet hate fighter. We've all got to have one or or a hundred. So, yeah, that's that's a good pick. I mean, he's he's going to be back for one for sure pretty soon. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, so, yeah. I'm so that looking forward to is, him losing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm sure we'll see it again. I mean, so the tournament's now set up with um, with those four fights to move on to the semifinals. Um, we're going to have Marek Gregorian against Alazov and Sipichai against David Kiria. Personally, not necessarily the matchups I would have made. I think Marek Gregorian and Chingiz Alazov is just a bit... Like, I want to see one of those guys... Or both of those guys in the final, ideally, because that fight is going to be absolutely insane. It's too mm-hmm. like Marek Gregorian's style nowadays is is very very offense minded, and he's he's totally fine with getting hit. And Chingiz Alazov is just all offense all the time. That's maybe my favorite kickboxing fight that One FC have ever ever booked. That one, um, I'm definitely going to be watching that. That's that's going to be spectacular. Sithichai against David Kiria. I believe Sithichai is either two and zero or three and zero against him already. I like David Kiria a lot. He's a very, very entertaining fighter. Mm-hmm. His fight against Andy Risty in 2014 for the Glory title is, I think, in most people's views, the best fight in the history of Glory. It's an absolute just... I'm not even going to mention the boxing fight that everybody mentions when they talk about just slobber knockers, and we all know what I'm talking about, but it is almost as close to that for kickboxing as you're going to find with um, with lightweights, so... I'd love to see David Kiria, you know, you know, do well in that fight, but he's probably just going to get tuned up by Sipichai there. Mm-hmm. But hey, we have to see. They have to fight the fights. Um, it's four quality fighters, and the tournament is... Yeah, the tournament's gone about as well as I think it could have. There haven't been any real major mishaps yet. All the fights yeah, are delivered. There weren't any freak accidents, weren't any like weird fouls that uh, ended... No, the closest the thing was the one judge that gave Typhon Ozcan the decision, which oh yeah, I, I yeah like, I, I don't like how the fuck like yeah. what? <laughs> which is another thing that One FC does is before these fights they announce they judge on a ten point must system, and then they don't announce the scores. They just say what judge thought which they fighter won. Also, which... do not name the judges. Like who who is judging the fights? We don't right, know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's so like they want to make it look official with the scoring system, and then there's just there's so little kind of meat behind it that I can trust. So, but at least yes, a win's a win, and Sithichai got it, and he deserved it. So, at at least uh, the overall shadiness coincided with what was the right outcome in this case. It's, it's kind of like we got lucky with this one. Not not sure about the future, but uh, oh no, gotta, there's there's gotta still take time. what we can get. Yeah, there's still time for the for the uh, 
inscrutable one uh, competition committee, whoever they are. Very funny you should say inscrutable because it's an Asian organization. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Just bringing all the all the worst word. tropes regarding Asians yeah. <laughs> to combat sports. The one does. <laughs> like, no, ooh. they do. I mean, yeah, Chatri's. Uh, well, we could do a whole podcast on Chatri. I mean, oh, honestly, we should. I'll, I'll, we really yeah. should. For the people out there, I will name drop another person that they should all be following on Twitter. If you're interested in just the utter utter insanity of of One FC, are you everything. are you talking about Jonathan of Kowloon? I am talking about our man Jonathan of Kowloon. If you follow him on Twitter, his 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 tag is Globe S V C S. That's Globe S V C S. Um, if I sound too informed about what this organization does, it's entirely down to me just pilfering what he posts. I mean, yes. He's the man on the inside. And he is uh, just, oh, the premier source on all the bullshit that goes on behind the scenes at one. Yes, he's he's just invaluable, and he's just been such a great service to the community. And it's it's just it's fascinating, it's hilarious, it's infuriating, it's everything rolled <laughs> into one to find out about like how this organization does things. Like like I have to say this, as an Asian man, looking at the way Chatri like milks all the stereotypes regarding Asia and Asians, mm. I find it like irksome on a very deeply personal, soulful level. Right. Uh, <laughs> like the names, the names for the fucking events. Yes. Like, Enter the Dragon, like, what one? Right. Like, yeah. Crane and the Shadow of an Eagle. Like, what the mm -hmm. fuck is this? Like, what mm -hmm. What are you doing? Yeah, it's very tropey and uh, schlocky and corny and all that kind of stuff. It's just um, milking on... Uh, I mean, I guess I understand where he's coming from as an uh, entrepreneur. He's... Uh, uh, sure, one is fee uh, is being fed by venture capitalists, and he has to bring in actual viewers and try to expand and all that kind of stuff. He has to make mm. money because uh, I'm assuming that if if he doesn't, there's always like a couple large men with drills standing by his door outside yes. his bedroom. But yeah, to the, 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 yeah, exactly. But to try and feed all this Orientalism machine to bringing viewers from from uh, the Western countries, it's it's not going to work. You're not gonna bring in viewers by uh, embracing all the weird, tropey shit regarding your own region. No, and and the the poverty fetishism, which is oh. really really woven into their marketing, doesn't help either. It's um, the thing, yeah. It's the thing that Jack Slack always talks about, like thanks to uh, the Christian Lieb, uh, thanks to the Lee sibling, uh, siblings, I can now become a doctor. Uh, what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, what are you talking I mean. about? God, I mean, the, the Lee family just being positioned where they are in the organization that, that talk about so much being, you know, poverty being strength. I mean, if people knew the kind of money those kids come from, it would blow their minds. I've seen their parents, like, real estate portfolio in Hawaii. It's nuts. It's just, it's so funny as a contrast to everything kind of, that the... The, the Lee brothers are basically essentially living out the plot of crazy rich Asians. <laughs> That's what yes. it is. <laughs> yeah, entirely. It's like that. These these are just super super rich kids who can train morning, noon, and night, and most of their opponents can't because they have to do real work and have real real jobs. That's and they're still the not very it's good. Economic. <laughs> they're still no, not right, very yeah, good at it. Yeah, they should be better, you know. So, but that's just that's just one of the contradictions that sits at the heart of this organization that makes it just endlessly fascinating to to watch to talk shit about. To just wonder how it, how long it's going to go. How long can they keep it going? I mean, they've <laughs> kept it going for a while. Every time Bloody Elbow talk about their finances, it's a disaster, and they're still here. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna ride this until the wheels fall off because it's just way too damn entertaining not and, to. And as we've seen, the fights are pretty damn good when they're good. So, yeah. It's a, it's it may not be the alternative to the UFC you're looking for. But it's still it's still an alternative nonetheless, and it's very entertaining in its own right, if for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. It's not um, it's not pure or cute, even though they want it to look like that so badly. Um, but goddamn, it's a lot of fun. But yeah, uh, I suppose we have exhausted the topic for today, and uh, before we depart, um, what what do you think? Just very quickly to. Um, to summarize the whole thing, what do you think uh, lies in the future with uh, kickboxing, so that our listeners may uh, may have things to look forward to? Yeah, so I mean, 
thinking thinking long term, Glory as as kind of the uh, the Western One FC are in a very similar position in that they're an organization that are backed by massive venture capital and have never made a penny for themselves. So they've survived the pandemic pretty easily because they were never set up to make money to begin with. They're, they're Pierre <laughs> Andorand's plaything. Pierre Andorand is like a giant rich oil trader who made an absolute killing off the pandemic. Like his uh, his portfolios, like uh, um, finances are all public and like they had an absolute bumper year last year. So Glory's not going anywhere. Um, they've uh, much to our you know, chagrin maybe, but they've got a card uh, coming up this week on um, Saturday, October the 23rd from Arnheim in the Netherlands where there are, there's a heavyweight title fight with Ruko Verhoeven. You've got Gokan Saki coming back against James McSweeney. Uh, yeah. So mileage may vary on the undercard. Um, Hamish is fighting, who's one of the best um, welterweights that they have. Obviously now Cedric Doumbé's left. You'll see him fighting for a title pretty soon, I imagine. Um, Benny, um, yeah, Jamal Ben Sadiq fighting Rico Verhoeven in the main event. That should be that should be a good fight, to be honest with you. I mean, their second fight um, went almost all five rounds. Ben Sadiq, you know, dropped Rico early on, started very fast. It's one of the best uh, heavyweight fights that Glory's ever put on. So if people people take a look at that fight, they'll see you know a preview of probably what we're going to get in the rematch. Um, yeah, that's coming up next week. Uh, there, there's, there's some good stuff on the undercard, but um, yeah. So Glory's going to keep trucking along. Um, one are going to keep trucking along. But the, the the best thing I think people can do is just um, if they really want to get into this stuff, it can only really be absorbed, you know, over a period of time through uh, consuming it. So come on. Beyond Kickboxing, I have a Discord server. It's very, very active now that Muay Thai's starting again. There's fights, you know, almost every single weekday in Thailand. There's always live streams for those. People are always talking about it. And then you've got the kickboxing on the weekends. So it's Beyond almost kickboxing too Twitter, active. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. It's tiring. It's exhausting. To yeah. These kids are just, they're on another level. I couldn't do it. I'm, I'm washed. But these, these Muay Thai kids are absolutely holding it down um, on the Beyond Kickboxing Discord server. So come and... Come and swing by, come say hi, come see what's going on. Beyond Kickboxing on Twitter, a podcast about kickboxing on SoundCloud. That's Dogman and Pathfinders, uh, like J Kick Breakdown. Uh, they get really, really deep into that. If you're also that very stuff. good, two very good fellows on Twitter. Yes. Two illustrious gentlemen, a podcast about kickboxing. That's all one word on SoundCloud. Um, they are, they aren't up to date on J Kick. They are J Kick, to quote MGK. And I mean, there are there are probably also the only JK guys <laughs> very active about it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> They've all we got, so appreciate them. Okay, uh, absolutely. And this is just kickboxing for you. It's a, it. That's why I found the casual fans the comment so funny. C casual fans of kickboxing. That's kind of uh, that's a bit of an oxymoron, isn't it? No, that's the biggest problem in the sport is the way it's set up prevents those people from ever existing. Yeah, and it, it's a bit of a kind of a mixed blessing, I suppose. It's a it could be a bit of a blessing in disguise because look at the type of people we have to deal with when discussing MMA day in day out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, the, it's the the price of of quote-unquote success and like a regular product that's easy to access is the uh the culture that comes along with that but, mm. um, fandoms yeah. they yes. ruin everything yeah they can yeah they can be they can be tricky yeah uh, before we depart and uh before i forget what was that uh rick overhoven versus uh alistair overeem silliness <laughs> did that come to oh, fruition wow. at all um, yeah so what was really funny is Alistair Overeem announced about three weeks ago after the fight, this was when the fight was announced, they'd done a press conference, like a very big one where they had a stage set up and they were talking to loads of media. Alistair Overeem announces that he's had an injury, he's pulling out of the fight, he can't, um, he obviously can't do the fight anymore. I can't remember if it was either, it was a hip related thing or like a very, like an old man kind of injury. But he admitted in the post that like the injury had already happened before the press conference that they'd done. Like, he'd been dealing with it for weeks, and he was already like, like, oh, I don't know if I can do the fight. So they'd poured a load of money into promotion for this event. And he's, yeah, he's gone. He's had to pull out of the fight. Um, he's been dealing with injury for over a month, he said. Yeah, two days before the press conference, he couldn't walk straight. So I don't know what happened to him. So, such he's a bizarre apart. chain of events as well. Yeah. Like, why would you do the presser then if you're so badly injured? Yeah, exactly. Who Who knew about this? 
why wasn't the announcement made quicker that uh, Ben Sadiq was going to step in? Fortunately, Jamal Ben Sadiq was already training for an opponent on this card. He was he was going to fight Adig Bui already, so it's not like mm. he's coming in off the couch. But what Ben Sadiq is coming in with is is an active uh, Rico case against him in in the uh, in the nation of Belgium because he's been involved in some like incredibly serious organized crime. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was like he was involved in like a crypto telecom scam where they were using like um secure like text texting phone networks to do like drug dealing <laughs> what the fuck <laughs> yeah that's also the other thing about kickboxing we'll do we'll do another episode about how it's all just ran by organized crime yeah this is one of those things that i've always found funny especially about jkick fans whenever they say that like uh oh the ufc is ran by uh, the mma is ran by dictators and like uh mafia mafiosos and all that kind of stuff uh, like, uh, kickboxing is also run by like the yakuza <laughs> yeah when it was at its best yeah when it was at its best it was ran by the yakuza and now that yeah. it's not ran by the yakuza and the, and ran by i guess sponsorships from uh the fashion brands that uh, takeru and tension are wearing uh it's just kind of not it <laughs> yeah it's, it's now ran by like streaming services which in my opinion is much worse yeah uh, at the very least when the yakuza was run the things the big tournaments actually happened yeah exactly the dirtier the money the better the fights are it's almost true just across the board i think uh, yeah it's kind of like the axiom for good combat sports in general That's right. <laughs> we don't want corporate dominion in the ufc we wish it we want it to be ran by organized crime then the ufc would become better and then uh, all combat sports will be enhanced if everything was run by organized crime organizations yeah that's why we liked when the fatigues were running things because of all their you know uh, connections the mafia the, the mob the connections country. yeah yeah <laughs> Shout out to frankie three sticks <laughs> my real ones will know what i'm talking about <laughs> hey. Uh, yeah man so, so, such a world what a oh weird my strange world oh, it it never gets old it really doesn't it's, it's yeah, the it's gift hilarious. that keeps on giving in all the wrong ways mm-hmm. <laughs> yes indeed uh, kickboxing is kind of very uh, very interesting to me as well from this perspective because with uh, MMA you are very used to fighters uh, being charged with domestic battery assault and battery uh, domestic violence uh, basically just uh, your regular run of the mill thuggery essentially mm. and and in kickboxing Blue sometimes crime. yeah like a, like a petty crime and yeah. with uh, uh, still very severe nonetheless I mean be- beating your wife uh, I mean it, it's still a time honored tradition in the combat sports world but mm. uh, it's not on par with running a telecom s- scam to siphon no. money out of data that has been <laughs> that's being uh, uploaded by the users. Yeah, I mean, those charges on Jamal Ben Sadiq are still pending. He hasn't beat that case. And uh, that's only the second most severe Rico case that he's got coming up. <laughs> Zinga. Uh. <sighs> that was painful, but yeah. I would allow it. I had to do it. You had to do it. Sometimes you just have to take the shot. Miss one hundred percent of the guy, shots you don't take. Yeah, he's fighting a guy called Rico while being in the mafia. <laughs> I mean, I hope Gloria set it up just for the the poetry of it. Yeah. Well, I suppose before we go completely off the rails, uh, this is uh, the bit where we can bring this whole thing to a close. A meandering close, but uh, still <laughs> an ending nonetheless. Uh, you've already plugged the Beyond Kick Discord and Beyond Kick uh, Twitter and uh, the kickboxing community and all the good follows. But do you have anything that you have to plug personally? Like things that you produce or may produce in the future? No, here's the thing. My thing is never doing any kind of work on that kind of stuff whatsoever. So I've got absolutely nothing to offer people other than the hookups and the connects to you know people who do produce things oh that's so, good enough in the kickboxing exactly. world that's essentially the same as recommending actual sources from which you can draw information from but uh, yeah i can i can give you the connection to meet the interesting people that's that's what i'm here to do uh the real kickboxing uh, was the friends that we made along the way wasn't it <laughs> yeah wasn't the- it just 
It really is. It really was. It is. No, I, I will. I will say on, on a serious note, um, the Beyond Cape Boxing like <clears> Discord <throat> basically came out of nowhere, and it's yeah, it's blossomed into a, like a hell of a little little unit there. Really, really cool community, and it's uh, yeah, I th- I think it's um, I think it's just been a testament to the strength of the appeal of the sport at the end of the day, and it does have just this unique drawing power to a certain group of people. And it's and it's kept them together through a really real. I want to stress this: a really tough time in the sport for the bigger promotions and uh, a period of huge uncertainty and inactivity. The uh, yeah, the Beyond Kickboxing Discord has uh, has endured through a lot of that shit. And yeah, I'm very grateful for it. If you if you thought that MMA is in a bit of a rut these days, you ain't seen nothing yet. Ugh. <laughs> I have no idea. But there is a, a point of commonality between uh, the Beyond Kick Discord and, uh, and the Fight Site, because uh, Beyond Kick Discord is uh, being essentially run by the Fight Site's very own Yot uh, mm-hmm. our uh, our media guy, our the designer, uh, the person who comes up with all the cool designs that the Fight Site has. And... Uh, yeah, man, Yod's a beast. Like the, guy, the, guy, the stuff the guy produces is, and how much of it he does is, yeah, it's just it's remarkable. His output is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, st- the amount of stuff that he does is insane. But uh, I guess that's just um, kind of a point of commonality between the fight side and uh, the kickboxing community. It's just the, the passion that everyone yes. has for the sport. Yes, absolutely. In, in spite of all the things that uh, threaten that fandom. <laughs> No, and, it is, yeah. Not, uh, <laughs> it's an abusive relationship, but it's it's one that's going to last a distance. It's kind of worth it in the end, I think. I do wonder I sometimes so. if it is worth it, but I th- right now I think it's worth it. It's yeah. the moments like these, like the uh, yesterday's event is what yes. makes it worth it. Yes, absolutely. Something that's that's just like a mem. It's the, those memories, those fight memories that you have that you know that you're going to like still have a very vivid recollection of a straight decade from now. You know exactly what that felt like in that moment. That's what it's all about. That's what I think keeps us all going. Yeah. And uh, now that we talked about communities, I would, I would plug my own community, our very own the Fireside Discord, where you can also converse with uh, like-minded fans and have a direct link to all the staff members of the website. I'm very active in there. And uh, if you have uh, some questions that are interesting or uh, podcast prompts uh, and uh, topic prompts that you think uh, could be very interesting uh, just subscribe to our discord at the five dollar tier and uh, join our community and shoot me your questions and I, I will make and provided it's interesting enough I will make an entire podcast episode uh, about your question and about your topic suggestions like uh, I have done in the past and um, yeah yeah uh, where was I going with this? There was something I wanted to say. Something profound. Hmm. Oh yeah, there was uh, 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 I, there would be um, there was a comparison that I wanted to make. Like, consider uh, more traditional sports like ball sports. No one in, in those uh, fan communities really rewatches the games. Conversely, with uh, combat sports, you always have the benefits of... Uh, being able to constantly rewatch the fights and the fights having the same amount of impact that they've had when you were watching them live. Yeah, not only that, they can they can reveal like layers to themselves that definitely don't get picked up on first yeah. viewing. Plans um, within plans and wheels with, within wheels. Yes, like Frank Herbert a, would say. Yeah, no, it really is a uh, it's a very like uh, enduring um, sort of event. These kind of things are you just you just. You end up watching them over and over again. I know I have with, with certain fights. Um, it's yeah, it's magical. It's transfixing. It's yeah, it's, it's unique. You can't get it anywhere else, which is why I think we put up with all the bullshit. Mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes all the bullshit does get a little bit uh, too much, and uh, I think it's uh, uh, really kind of uh, in our own interest to point all these things out uh, to put to at least somehow control the flow of bullshit. <laughs> so it sure. doesn't doesn't go completely to shit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and on that note, I guess uh yeah, to very quickly get uh, the rest of the plugs out of the way. Subscribe to check out the fight site, subscribe to our Patreon, uh, the, the, yada yada yada. Subscribe to all the things that uh, looks at you should subscribe to and you should subscribe to them because uh I've uh, followed his advice long ago and I have not regretted it since. 
and uh, I hope to, and I certainly, I'm sure that I won't regret it in the future. And uh, that depends <laughs> on the amount of shit posting that the Dogman and Pathfinder would do. <laughs> yes, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who's gonna stop him? Let's be honest. I mean, true. Yeah. Th- there's no one else. No. <laughs> <laughs> They kind of have, they kind of have the monopoly on shit yeah, posting, yeah. And kickboxing. Yeah, exactly. They do. They own it. Him and Karayev fan. Oh. <laughs> Let me tell you about that guy. <laughs> oh. uh, but yeah, so thank you very much for joining me for this one. This was a very fun discussion. Uh, haven't this? Haven't had this much fun since that time I went on heavy hands and ruined the show. <laughs> yeah except no, in this, no, this case was... it was an, an actual conversation <laughs> well yeah i'm just i guess i'm low energy today but um no I, I, this was a this was a fucking blast man this was great i enjoyed uh i enjoyed just shooting the shit on these fights um yeah and i enjoyed doing it like they're they're so fresh in our minds this was all this all all this happened like less than 24 hours ago which I yeah think. it's uh, kind of the best way to discuss your impressions uh, totally. I found that every time that I wait to just come up with a very good, like a very solid structure to discuss the fights, it kind of becomes clinical in a way. Yeah, you you end up reheating it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, once again, thank you very much for joining me and very much looking forward to repeat appearances. Yeah. We, that's one, uh, that podcast about one championship, it has to happen. Yes. And on that note, thank you for listening. You've been listening to Tangry Dome episode 24. I have no title for this one. I'll come up uh, come up with it in post. Something something I'm going to probably going to be something stupid. <laughs> As it always is, but either way, uh I suppose that's enough of that. We've already stretched the ending of this podcast as much as we could. So this is the end of the show. You can go away now. Peace. Che- Cheers. Yes.